Welcome to Artificially Intelligent Marketing, a weekly podcast where we stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, helping you get the best results from your marketing efforts. Now let's join our hosts, Paul Avery and Martin Broadhurst. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 16 of Artificially Intelligent Marketing. I am joined, as always, by my very good friend, Martin Broadhurst. How are you, Martin, and what have you been up to? I'm very good. It's uh, It's been a busy week in the world of AI for me. been delivering some workshops, two workshops this week, one on getting started with uh, ChatGPT, and the other one was very much uh, an email marketing-focused one, but we, we did a bit of a deep dive into how AI can help with email marketing in that. Uh, in one of the sessions, though, we got completely derailed as uh, people started having a conversation amongst themselves about universal basic income and how they might need to find new ways to make a living in the future as AI takes their jobs. Hopefully they weren't too worried about that. I'm sure you were showing them how, as the human in the loop, they're um, very much driving the system. It's not driving them, at least at this point in time. Yeah, very much so. I'm telling them how it can augment their role as opposed to uh, completely replace. But uh, yeah, it was an interesting discussion. How about yourself? What have you been up to this week? Oh, what have I been up to? It's been lots of, I haven't been out and about so much this week. It's been lots of new client engagement conversations, which has been fantastic. I've met some fan, really interesting companies this week. I met one um, that's doing some really great stuff with with using AI as part of analyzing 3D protein structures, which was really interesting. Um, so that was brilliant and, uh, yeah, just getting involved in a few client projects where I could help. So yeah, good week for me, basically in the office, less out and about, which was nice. Yeah. Bit of a, bit of a breather after you were gallivanting up north of the border the other week. Indeed. I think I'm going to be out and about next week and the week after delivering some strategy sessions and meeting with some different clients. So, um, yeah, I'm going to be back on the road. Uh, maybe we'll have to do our recording on the road. That would be exciting. Um, what have we got for our listeners this week? Well, as usual, we've got our main stories, our short snippets and our tool of the week. So the main stories we're going to cover are Meta's Meta Talking AI for marketers at the Cannes uh, Lions um, AI, not AI, advertising um, event this week. We've got loads of generative image news this week. So we've summarized all of that into one big story. We'll talk about Meta's new all-in-one voice synthesis tool, uh, the demo videos of which sound really cool, look really cool, very interesting. And we're going to talk about ClickUp, which is a very popular project management tool, especially in agency land. Um, and it's made its AI-powered assistant available more widely and actually brings a lot of tools and I think maybe is a, a little indicator as to where we might see a number of other tools um, go in the future. So we're going to dig into that. The tool of the week this week is going to be Perplexity AI. Right, let's look at our short snippets. We'll rattle through these at muy rapido. We're Eleven Labs, a voice technology research company that we've mentioned before on the podcast and a world leader in uh, AI, audio, synthesis, etc., has raised another chunk of cash and $19 million as part of a Series A to continue the research and development and improvement of its product and taking that product more widely to market. Vimeo has launched some new AI tools. So if you're a Vimeo user to host your videos, you'll see that there are three new features, um, including a script generator, a teleprompter, and a text-based video editor that identifies and allows you to remove filler words, pauses, and awkward moments, etc. cetera, uh, perhaps a little Descript-like. So I think if you're on the standard plan or above, you get access to these by default. So if you're a Vimeo user, go and have a look and have a little play. On the video front, Loom, uh, which is a screen recording tool and video hosting tool that a lot of people use, launched an AI generative tool to auto title videos and also include a short summary underneath the video. So it's done auto transcripts for a while. I'm a Loom user, which is why I was interested in this. Um, I do a lot of how-to videos for various um, use cases, and I have to admit, the auto title and auto summarizer have saved me a lot of time, but it's also really handy if you've got lots of videos like I have to just quickly read the AI-generated summary, and then it reminds you, oh yeah, that's video, that video, or that's the video, and I think in many cases, it may even save people having to watch the video. So if you're a Loom user, check that out. But Have you 
tested that to see if it does that to your old videos then the ones that were pre this it won't do it to my old videos oh, it's that's one a of the shame. it's one of the first things that's gone up on the forums is can we have this to apply to our old videos um i don't know how they would manage for that or whether they'd be worried about an absolute deluge of users right if, if we were got 500 videos and we would just push them all in in one go yeah that could be a bit of a problem the other thing is i fed it a massive video and it went sorry computer says no on that one and it wouldn't it was like over an hour long and it just said no i can't do it so it's been perfect for my five and ten minute like screen share how to's longer form videos not so much uh in other news this week we had inflection deputing its own foundational ai model to rival google and open ai's llms it's an ai startup that has inflection one and it also has a conversational agent called pi the model is roughly gpt 3.5 size uh, and it has capabilities that are on par or superior to other models around gpt 3.5 according to the company um, i've actually used this because you can access it through whatsapp like a little chat friend um, and you can just use it as a brainstorm partner for a wide variety of topics, uh, whether that's like business questions, marketing questions, um, mindfulness questions, anything you like. It's kind of like your personal assistant in your pocket. I found it to be really good. But when I, I was doing some stuff where I wanted to like be consistent in my mindfulness mind, and I asked it to remind me at seven o'clock every day, it's time to do 10 minutes of mindfulness. And it just never reminds me. So I message it back and I go, I don't know if you know, but you forgot to remind me again. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry, Paul, I forgot to remind you, but I'm glad you pointed this out because I'll definitely remind you tomorrow. And then it doesn't again. So I've kind of, there's some good stuff of it, but some areas for improvement. And useful feedback for them, I'm sure. Yeah, we'll get them, we'll get them on the podcast. You're all welcome on the podcast. Um, obviously, we've got Zach. Zuckerberg's on next week as already discussed. He, I, my phone. Is this, is this before or after his fight with Elon Musk? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to go and do a, a live stream of said fight and then I'll interview him straight after. In the cage, straight yeah. away. <laughs> Regardless of what state he's in. Um, for those of you who don't know what we're talking about, there's been a bit of banter on the old Twitter sphere between Elon Musk and Mark Zuckerberg about having a cage fight because um, um, Zuckerberg is doing quite a lot of um, martial arts training at the moment. And supposedly, Dana White has been in the middle of them. Then UFC president Dana White has been in the middle of them and spoke, spoke to both of them, and he claims that they're deadly serious about doing this. It's it's ridiculous. Fire the Century pay-per-view, $20, get your cash in. I'm, I've <laughs> genuinely seen stories saying $100 pay-per-view and all the money goes to charity. I think I would probably pay. It would just be fascinating to see how that would play out. Yeah. Um, last couple <laughs> of short snippets then. We've got, um, according to Group IB, over 100,000 chat GPT accounts were breached between um, June 22 and May 23 and shared on the dark web. We talked previously about companies banning employees from using um, chat GPT because of potential sharing of proprietary information. Um, this might make a few people nervous who might have shared some proprietary information and then had those accounts. Their, maybe their account was one of those that was hacked. So I think this is a perfect example of how um, OpenAI probably need to figure out how to make it a really robust software product, not something they sort of went to market very quickly with. They now need to provide sort of enterprise level security. But hey, that's probably a discussion for another day. And then the last story this week was, according to a recent UK-wide survey by email specialist Instiller, one in two people can't spot an AI-generated email, and less than one in three, you know, they you basically don't care about AI and their brand communications. So what does that tell us as marketers? Perhaps we can experiment with a bit of AI to auto-personalize our emails because a bunch of people are not going to spot yeah. it. And even those that do may not care that much as long as they're getting valuable information, which I think was interesting. We've talked before on the podcast, Martin, about lies, damn lies and statistics and uh, yeah. the questions you ask and the groups that you ask and how you can basically get whatever answer you want, depending on how you frame all those things. But I thought it was an interesting enough one to chuck into our short snippets. 
Yeah, on, on that very point, actually, I saw an interesting Twitter thread where someone had tweeted a, an infographic and it said uh, the percentage of studios, and I think it was game development and movie studios, any kind of creative studios, the percentage of studios using different AI tools, and they had a big list of them in a, in a graph, and it said 22% were using auto GPT. And someone else had, uh, re, uh, had quote tweeted this particular graph and said, uh, I'm absolutely convinced there are zero users of auto GPT, zero, none. <laughs> and then a great conversation thread be below where it was just loads of people saying, yeah, I used auto GPT for an afternoon. It was novel, but didn't really do anything. It's not fit for purpose. Nobody is using this in a commercial serious setting. That is interesting. Oh, yeah. One of my friends who used it basically could have been the one who tweeted about the afternoon. Had a real run at it. Is very, very capable. It's a mill that we had on the podcast, actually, yeah. for, for yeah. listeners. Um, knows how to get the best out of these things and found it very, very difficult to get it to do anything meaningful in a way that uh. you could rely on the output. So, yeah, it's we're in that part of the of, of the development of these tools where they can almost do a lot of great stuff, but they're just too unreliable in a number of areas to make them your go-to tool. Yeah, and the, there are some real subtleties, it, just, even in, like a really simple example with prompting. So um, I was playing around this week with uh, ChatGPT. It was actually on the, the, the workshop and I was showing people how using ChatGPT and specifically GPT-4, you could ask it to create documents from scratch using Google Apps Script to create you. For example, the, the a particular example I was using was a customer feedback form. So if you're designing a customer survey, you've got to come up with the questions, you've got to come up with all of the, the rating systems and what have you. So you just ask it to, to write you a survey using best practice. It writes that. If you're happy with that, great. And then say, create this using Google Apps Script. And then it will give you the script. And then you drop that in Google Apps Script and it will create you the form in seconds. So like you, you have your customer feedback form done in no time at all. And I was showing this to the to the room full of people. And the first response that it gave me, I noticed a very subtle um, element of the output, which basically meant that it wasn't going to create a new form. It was going to try to edit an existing form and I had to give it my existing form ID. And I spotted that and corrected it and just changed my prompt to say, create a new form. So just a very slight, subtle difference. But in that session, everyone was like, how did you spot that? How did you know that? And I thought that's interesting that it's only when you're using these tools day in, day out, that you can, you can see them and adjust them. And, you know, going back to what we said previously about UI and UX being the kind of key differentiator, when you've got to have that tinkerer, you've got to have that kind of tinkerer mindset to make something work. Most people don't have that tinkerer mindset. So if it doesn't just work for them straight away, they're just going to go, oh, it was novel. It was interesting, but no, not for me. Um, and that's kind of the response I got from people in that room when I showed them that. It, they were like, oh, that's it's cool that it can do that, but mm, I don't think I'll. I think I'll just spend the, the hour making the fall. Well, and this is it, right? Like that will slow adoption. And maybe we'll all learn over time just precisely enough how to prompt these things to get what we like out of it, like the actual intended output. I think also your story there, you spotted that you needed to give it the ID, right? So again, it's an informed person running the process who can check the output and go, that's not right. I think somebody who wouldn't be able to see the technical aspects there or understand them or know they're important might be like, oh, this is broken. Yeah. Why is it broken? Work. Right. Um, and then you got a problem solve it. And I think even I was reading another one of the 10,000 bajillion AI newsletters that I'm signed up to. Um, about just how important ongoing prompting is. Like, expect to go in having to have five to ten prompt conversation to get what you want. And if you go in with that mindset, then you're probably going to get some really good outputs out of, say, chat GPT. And I've seen people produce some really great starter prompts that just basically frame the conversation. Like, this is who you are, chat GPT. This is the type of thing we're going to try and achieve. I want to ask you to ask me really great questions to help improve the output, but then eventually I'm going to ask you to produce the output. And then there's a bit of back and forth and it coaches you through extracting the information mm. it needs from you. And I think that's yeah. really powerful, but that's not 
to your point, what people are expecting when they log in. No. It's going to be fascinating to see if, because there was also back along, Sam Altman um, and the team of OpenAI were on a, on a variety of podcasts, he said something similar, which is when we get these tools where they need to be, you won't need to be a prompt engineer because we want the tools to be able to figure out what you want quickly and easily without having you having to learn how to get what you want. Um, obviously, that would remove this, but I don't think we're going to get to that because half the time it's because the human doesn't really know what they want. Like it's in their brain, but they've not articulated in any clear way. And if they said it to another human, the other human won't have a clue either. So of course the machine yeah. doesn't know. Yeah. Yeah. If you were telling a, a, a member of staff or a colleague, you'd, you'd be going kind of back and forth and figuring it out on the fly with them. So yeah, absolutely. It's, a, uh, it's always going to be iterative, isn't it? Again, it's like, it's like it's an assistant. Yeah. We called it, um, the alien intern when I was at the SAMPS event the uh, the other week and I and I do think that is the best way to look at it right give it a precise brief because it, it doesn't have the background of knowledge and expertise that you do because you so you really have to spell it out and every now and again it will come up with something completely like it doesn't understand how people work or how the world works because uh, because it's not human but um, right let's crack into our main stories the first main story this week is about this um event martin you're going to take us through um what you saw here yeah so meta have been one of the headline sponsors at the big annual advertising event the can lions uh and you know this is where all of the the major advertisers the big players all get together everyone that's uh making waves in the advertising industry and there's a big awards as well for the best best campaigns and what have you but Meta have been talking about their investments in AI and what that means for businesses and for marketers in particular. So they said they've been investing in AI powered technologies. We know this, we've been covering their, uh, their research papers and new product launches every single week. And, you know, obviously a big area of focus for them is generative AI. So they said there's three areas of focus for them, which includes AI assistants, AI stickers, and AI media editing now the assistance is exactly as you'd expect it to be it's going to be assistance for businesses running through the likes of messenger whatsapp um, and uh, you know dms and instagram and, and things like that and these are going to be used for things like customer experience uh, sorry, uh, uh, sorry not customer experience customer support um but also providing interesting customer experiences so you can totally imagine interacting with certain brand voices or uh, influencers that have aligned with a brand that you'll be able to kind of play games with them or, or just kind of Q&A them, that kind of thing. They're talking about bringing brand experiences to these assistants. There seems to be some suggestion as well that they're really looking at turning these into AI agents as well. So how we saw uh, Google talking about Bard being able to book tickets for you and like you can actually make purchases and transact through there. I think that's where Meta have also got an eye on uh, these developing in the future as well. Um, there was also the AI stickers. Now, this one was an interesting one to me because I hadn't really paid any attention to stickers at all. Are, is, are you have you used stickers in any meaningful sense? Not at all. In fact, when no. you said it, I was like, mm, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> yeah, so. I, I've been kind of vaguely aware of them. if you're in WhatsApp, you can post a sticker and. The, I've seen, you know, is it like business fish was one that was going around a while ago of it's a little sticker of it's a fish in a business soup and it doing it's in like different scenarios. Anyway, it's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> it sounds it. <laughs> <laughs> but I was I was in a, a a group chat the other week. I was on a stag do and somebody turned one of the photos from the stag weekend into a sticker and posted it into the group. Now I know what you mean. Yes. Just like those little you, images. You that... just had to say stag do and I got it. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, I'm there. I'm on board. <laughs> yeah. And and I love the way that so the one that I saw was someone had, you know, cropped and basically cropped the um the silhouette of, of my mate and did a cut out of them and turned it into a sticker. Businesses are going to be able to use these stickers and AI generate these stickers and basically have people use them posting them in conversations. There's a particular phrase that they talked about. They said, um, 
We can imagine a world where businesses are able to create customer stickers tied to moments in time or a marketing campaign that will allow for a new creative medium to engage and delight their customers. Do you know what? I hear that part and I look at this and I'm like, yeah, AI driven customer support and customer experience through generative AI that then frees up humans to do other things and could be done personalized at scale, huge commercial value. AI generated stickers. I'm like, I don't even understand what the point of that is. So you know what's going to happen? That'll blow up and have ridiculous <laughs> commercial value. Um, and I can't quite see it because I'm not an expert in that area, and I'm probably uh, probably going to end up being way off. But it's the juxtaposition of those seems quite strange to me. Yeah, it is, isn't it? It's like, but again, I'm I'm like you. I don't really see it. But before you know it, half a trillion in market cap will be added to to meta based purely on their sticker strategy i mean they must know so much more than us so one assumes there's big commercial opportunity in offering ai generated stickers but i'd love to see it they say billions of stickers are sent on meta platforms every month billions every month i mean i've seen one in like the past six months i think it must be young people martin i think it must be young people yeah we're not young anymore we gotta own that right that that ship has well and truly sailed um i did that speaking of being young i went to a like a day rave on this stag do the other week and my word did i feel old there was there was a 25 year old and i thought you look old so if you look old and i'm considerably older than you crikey you had me at day rave that sounds like what an old person would go to anyway we digress tell us more about this event it ended at it ended at 10 p.m. It was fantastic. It's ideal. You're in bed by 11. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, anyway, yeah. So what else did they introduce? They announced their AI media editing. So uh, image generation models um, and basically being able to edit videos. So AI generated videos, um, things that are going to help creative campaigns. So you can take some of your existing Im- imagery and maybe put a seasonal twist on it without you know having to do a whole new reshoot that's quite an interesting concept if you've done some like uh product videography and then you want to put it in a um you know halloween setting or christmas setting you can do that using ai so again speaking about where the where the commercial applications for these kind of things come in totally get it i, I can see how that is going to dramatically help creative teams small business owners you know large marketing teams doesn't matter who you're going to be able to use that to get better creative done quickly or maybe not even better creative just more variations of existing creative for more suitable applications like i say seasonality and and what have you um who knows you can maybe even turn those uh, interesting creatives into stickers and that becomes your new lead campaign yeah, I still, I've, I think I'm going to have to see that to believe that, but okay. And like I said, definitely turn out to be wrong because there's so much smarter people who know more about this than me who clearly think this is going to be a big thing. Um, well, look, yeah, right. all in, a whole load of tools there for, for, for marketers. Interesting stuff. Interesting scuff, stuff. Okay, well, so on the generative side, there was a absolute ton of generative image news this week so there was mid journey 5.2 so uh, improvements to mid journey uh, <clears throat> that includes a zoom out feature so we've talked a bit about clip drops uncrop and we've talked a bit about photoshop adobe photoshop's ability to produce um really quite accurate expansions of images filling in you know, allowing you to basically see the area around an image that wasn't real, but it actually looks quite real. So it's not a surprise maybe that Mid Journey's looking to get in on the act there with their zoom out feature. Um, I've been having a little play with this and it actually works reasonably well, um, which I guess it would given the fact that the other tools have managed to do this pretty good as well. Um, there is a small increase in image quality there as well, I think. Um, so then on the back of that, we also have Stability AI has launched a new A model, 
AI uh, model called SDXL 0.9, which you can access, I think, on Dream Studio and probably on uh, ClipDrop as well, which produces more photorealistic images. And I haven't had a play with that one, but the examples I've seen certainly look quite a significant improvement. I don't know if you've managed to have a go with this yet. Yeah, Mark. I had a, a play with it this afternoon. I mean, it was released you know, about 12 hours ago, so not had a great deal of time to jump into it, but they look really smart. I think they've done a good job with that. I tested it with a, a bunch of different situations. I tried photorealistic um, images of snowboarding on the kind of Alps and that kind of thing, and they look fantastic. Um, so the, the reason I picked that one as well is I had a comparison from the from the old model that I could do like for like comparison, and it was definitely a, a step change. Right. So I think this is good news for those people. I. I've had feedback um, and I found it myself that accessing mid-journey through Discord and then trying to subscribe and it just, it's quite hard. It feels a bit technical. Discord hasn't got the best user interface in the world. It's a bit confusing. And I think a lot of people have either given up or just decided not to use mid-journey because Discord and the way that you have to access it is so hard. And I think seeing stability AIs models improve where they can get closer to the outputs of mid journey is going to make a lot of people smile it won't be long before mid journey have got their own web apps though they are asking for beta testers um on that at the moment so mid journey is going to be bringing that to the table before long good stuff i think that is definitely going to make access easier for people and probably help stimulate their their commercial development as well um there's more there's more generative image news. Um, we've got Meta launching their um, AI image creation model, iJepa, which can complete unfinished images more accurately than existing models. Um, and they will be open sourcing the training coder model Checkpoint. So if this ends up being commercialized, it's just another sort of tool in the toolbox for creatives to amend their images and add things that weren't there before or remove aspects of images that that aren't appropriate so for example um some of the examples that are in the the blog post from meta announcing this show sections of images completely cut out so you could imagine i don't know an animal obscured by a bus you could only see the back end of the animal but you want to see the front end its ability to to sort of paint that back in looks quite interesting so i think that's going to be quite cool so Lots of improvements in image generation. We've talked a lot about image generation on the show, Martin, and I think well, these are getting more and more impressive all the time. And this has all come to a head this week when Marvel Studios used AI, um, we believe mid-journey, but unsubstantiated at this point, to create the opening of its new series on Disney Plus, Secret Invasion. So this is not some designers tinkering with some creative ideas as inspiration for um you know a small campaign for a small brand this is marvel and disney arguably some of the biggest um sort of brands on the planet using these tools to generate the opening credits and there's been a bit of a hullabalah hasn't there about the, that this this week martin there has it has um, ruffled some feathers, and you can understand why when the uh, Hollywood screenwriters uh, strike is currently on, uh, and one of the things that they've mentioned in that is that they want to stop studios from using AI for writing purposes. So to see this actually being used on a flagship series from Marvel Disney is a yeah, it's quite big. I've got a few tweets here from, from people um, commenting on it. Um, Secret Invasion intro is AI generated. I'm devastated. I believe AI to be unethical, dangerous, and designed solely to lim eliminate artists' careers. Spent almost half a year working on this show and had a fantastic experience working with the most amazing people I've ever met. That's from uh, Jeff Simpson. So people working closely on the show were uh, voicing their their concerns. Yeah, and you can understand it, really. I mean, it's the type of thing that would have usually been produced by a company and by a team. You would imagine a fair bit of money gets spent on these things and, um, you know, and keeps a, a reasonable number of people busy producing those things. 
So it's really interesting. The argument that I'll paraphrase probably badly made by Marvel around this was they felt it was in keeping with the with the show. Because obviously with Mid Journey you get not quite photorealistic images, they look a bit strange and the whole premise of this series is nothing is as it seems and um it's basically about some shape-shifting creatures who can look like people so they kind of wanted it to have that unrealistic quality that this is this morphing quality that i think you can get some quite cool stuff out of mid journey when you're trying to do that um but if you ask me my um my ball poo meter was going ding 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 because that sounded just like a good <laughs> A good excuse as to why they did it. Maybe they did it for money reasons. Maybe somebody went, "Oh, wouldn't it be cool? Let's use let's use AI for this," and then just didn't realise the backlash it was going to cause. I don't know, but interesting. I mean, personally, you know, we, it's, it's it's difficult to um, to to criticise it when you're talking about these technologies every week, as we are doing. I can understand why people are doing, but ultimately, there was a team of people sat behind this doing the prompting, doing the editing. I'm sure they didn't just type in uh, some words into mid-journey and get this out in an instant. You know, it wasn't like a one-shot thing. Someone's had to 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 prompt it in all the different scenes, stitch it together, edit it, do a lot of work over the top of it. So, yeah, I think maybe the... Um, I can understand why people feel upset, but there were people being paid to do that. I'm sure a company or someone took a fee and that hasn't done people out of work uh, too much. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what the workflow looked like and how much time it took versus going down a more traditional route because, you know, iteration being a bit of a theme for the whole podcast since we started, but certainly today, you're right. I don't think they would have got the outputs they wanted without some iteration. And of course, it's an intro to a TV show. It lasts about a minute. There's quite a few images in there. Yes, I suspect it would have taken longer to create a bunch of those images from scratch, but it's not, yeah, like you said, you know, a morning's worth of work and they already had production ready images and they literally just needed to stitch them together. I, I doubt that was the case. So be interested to see. I'd love to know more about that. If you were involved in the process of putting this together and you want to come on the podcast, tell us what workflow you went through so that actually we can get a bit of feel for what the creative process looks like when you're creating TV titles using AI. We'd love to hear that um let's move on from generative image news to another meta story this is the meta episode they didn't sponsor it martin so i am really unhappy i'm going to be straight on the phone to my pal uh we need some cash. yeah yeah if we're going to feature this much matter we, we you know there's got to be there's got to be a little uh a little uh something in it um i i'm teasing obviously the um this one's about meta's new text speech tool called voice box tell us about this mike because the video is pretty cool right yeah i would recommend people go check out the blog we'll put it in the show notes uh, as usual uh, so this is an all-in-one generative speech tool and we've seen generative speech tools we spoke about 11 labs at the spot start of the session you know they are doing a synthetic voice and their products really cool but what um meta have done with this particular model is really over and above what we've seen before by by some way so this is a text-to-speech synthesis you type in some words and a voice will say those words um it synthesizes speech across six languages including taking your your voice in one language so you can kind of train it and then it will make your voice speak in another language so that's pretty cool you know i don't speak uh, portuguese but we could make me speak portuguese it can also perform tasks that it wasn't trained on, which is this emergent capability that we see in LLMs. It has noise removal, which in the demo is really neat. There's a clip of uh, Mark Zuckerberg speaking with a dog barking in the background, and then it cuts that out completely. So where we've seen similar things from other providers, um, where voices can be optimized for podcasts like with adobe studio is it adobe studio uh, is that what it's something called? like that adobe enhance i think enhance, the one we use on the podcasters yeah um yeah so it's like that but uh, more so so it can give it that crisp audio feel but also remove background noise quite um quite strongly as well it has uh 
language conversion. So it will take your voice and change the language, even when the two things are written in different parts. I wasn't fully sure I understood that, but it all sounds very cool. And it's 20 times faster than current models and it outperforms single purpose models. So models that have been trained specifically for that task. Uh, and it does that through in-contact learning. So incredibly capable. Would love to get my hands on it. Uh, I do like playing with these kinds of tools. Lovo.ai and Jenny we featured on the show uh, previously. Uh, and that's pretty cool, but just, just falls down in some areas. Uh, unfortunately, as much as I would like to get my hands on it, Meta are not uh, opening this up to public release. This is not going to be available at the moment. This is very much still in there. Uh, research paper and hey look isn't this a cool thing that we've done phase um so i'm sure they're going to commercialize it through the ai assistants and ai agents that we spoke about earlier in the episode you can start to see how all of these things kind of piece together uh, you know get a, get a celebrity train their voice stick that into the ai agent then all of a sudden you've got a nice interactive avatar where you're speaking to and um, the latest celebrity on love island or you know sports star or whatever it may be uh, but until then uh, they're not doing it and the reason they say they're not doing it is because of the potential for misuse which i do buy i do think that this does have uh, a great potential for misuse based on the quality of the outputs we see on the demo uh, but also i can see that you know from a commercial uh, perspective it would be quite beneficial to just keep that one under wraps for a bit and say no, you're not having it. We're going to integrate this into our tools and you lot can figure it out how yourself if you want to use something similar. Yeah, it's a, it's really cool. And it just wonder, it makes you wonder how far it can go. So the audiobook industry surely is about to fundamentally change. I mean, I could probably have Stephen Fry read every book I've got on my Kindle at some point because he's wonderful, by the way, when he does narrate. Um, the stories and I'm sure they could never capture his performance if I'm really honest but you know are we getting to the point where you buy a Kindle book and you can have it in the audiobook version in effect for the same price I don't know right I currently buy quite a lot of audiobooks and Kindle books and sometimes I've got copies you know the audio and the uh, the Kindle version but well yeah will anyone need to go in a booth again or will, there be, will we be able to A, use any famous person who commercializes their voice for this year use, or as I've seen with a number of other models, train these systems on about one minute of speech from us and have us, or, you know, or the author, and have them narrate their own audio book, but without having to do the work. Yeah, I mean, that when you start thinking about the, the actual productization of this, that is absolutely where to go. Audio books are booming as an industry, and the idea that, you know, self-published authors, um, some a friend of mine at the moment is currently about to self-publish uh, a sports performance book. And I said, oh, have you thought about doing it as, a, as an audio book? And hadn't, well, then we discussed it and spoke about, you know, you can get a studio, you can go in, record it over eight hours or something. And the look on her face was just like, oh no, that sounds terrible. But if you could turn it into an audio book in the press of a button, absolutely should do it absolutely and i'm guessing you could you could have it speak for you in a very confident eloquent manner just using the the timbre of your voice whereas you know if a person might sit in a booth and feel a bit nervous and stumble over their words and not feel very confident about it whereas the ai is going to have none of that right it's just going to mimic your voice and then deliver this wonderful clear version so yeah this is a uh, really interesting, and um, as marketers, obviously, it's going to give us the ability to perhaps produce things in the voice of our SMEs, but without having to bother our SMEs, right? Imagine running a a webinar where you can see the slides, but you can't see the person, and actually, the webinar was scripted, and you had one of your SMEs or your CEO as the voice, but you never really had to bother them and use their time. That could be pretty powerful. Um, right, let's do our last story. We're cracking on through. This is about the project management tool ClickUp, um, which many people probably uh, on the podcast will use. And if not, it's worth having a look um, because it's pretty expansive in terms of its capabilities. It is a project management tool, but it's got a Google Docs built in it. It's got automations built in it. And now it's got an AI powered assistant built into it. So 
um, if you look at the press release on the ClickUp website on their blog, it claims that it has a hundred plus AI tools optimized for every role and use case, um, which is pretty interesting. And that there's a they've they've teamed up with uh, dozens of experts to create fully templatized prompts to make it even easier for people to use. The um, I think one of the interesting things here is the text generation capabilities. So you can highlight any text within ClickUp, like a document, a comment, task description, and then you can use the AI toolbar to improve the con the content, or you can make it longer or shorter or simplify the writing style. So again, a lot of the things we've come to see in a lot of the writing tools that are out there, but now this is being baked into the project management tool that you use. Do you need your writing tool anymore? That's the question, right? If you're a ClickUp user, do you need Jasper, right? To be, to be determined. Um, it can also generate text from scratch, um, which, you know, will help you with creating emails and blog posts, and it will summarize transcripts and other things that you, that you give it. So it's almost like ClickUp is becoming really more than a project management tool. And if ClickUp is doing this, we should expect other tools to do this. And this really fits in with something we've talked about a lot, Martin, in terms of which tools should people buy? Whatever tools they buy, unless they can get a really good deal, like on a lifetime deal, they should not be subscribing for a year. Because if they're using six, seven, eight different tools, they are going to be consolidated into Copilot or Bard or ClickUp. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more of this. The use cases that ClickUp talk about offering are for marketing, you could easily write a case study or generate a creative brief. For sales, they suggest you could help use AI to help you create a territory plan, write prospecting emails. For product development, you could um, write product requirement documentation, design a user testing study. For engineering, you could create a sprint retrospective report, generate a model schema. I don't even know what that stuff is. The model schema part, I mean, project management, you can create a statement of work, spin up a project timeline, and all of this power is coming into ClickUp AI for an extra $5 per user per month. So it's already quite low cost. I think it's like the business level is like $12 a user. Imagine all the time and other, as you just saved and all the other tools you don't need. The competition is heating up. Now, ClickUp already has a lot of users. So when we've talked about moats on the show before, ClickUp has a moat because it's got really a lot of users already um but that's pretty cool so if you've never had a play with click up and you you have a project management tool that you don't love or you're thinking Do you know what we could probably be better organized if we actually just used a tool to enable it um generative ai stuff that's been added to, to click up might be worth going and have a little look at right last bit today then is tool of the week which is perplexity ai mine tell us about perplexity Perplexity is a really cool search engine. And it was uh, when ChatGPT launched and people were saying it didn't have real time data and all of this kind of thing. Uh, and before we got plugins and before we got browse with uh, ChatGPT, Perplexity popped up and it's available on perplexity.ai. And it started out as just a very simple. Uh, search box which would you put in your search query and it is powered by chat gpt or should i say gpt uh, 3.5 and actually it does have some gpt4 uh, capabilities as well now but basically it's a search engine if you go on there now um you will you can sign up and you can put a profile in which will help um tailor the results to you but you can ask it anything uh in fact on the home screen, as you go on there, there are some examples already. So I'm just going to click on the one that I see now. It says world's most livable cities 2023. And it's very similar to the kind of uh, Google's generative search experience. So if you click on that result, it doesn't bring up a bunch of websites you can visit. Instead, it answers the question. And it says the Economist Intelligence Unit's Livability Index 2023 has ranked the world's most livable cities etc and it goes on and lists all of the cities but it provides references as well so against every fact that it provides it gives you a reference to a, a source that you can then go and dig into that uh, further it's available as a chrome extension now the chrome extension is the tool that i use every day um, it has a summarize feature 
So when you're on any web page, you can just click on the perplexity icon and it brings up saying, uh, you can ask it anything, but there's a big summarize button. You can just say this page and it will then summarize whatever the article is that you're reading and it will give you a kind of paragraph about that. But the neat thing about it is that it has, rather than it just being a summarization tool, it actually has a prompt window as well. So you can say, you know, like you would with ChatGPT or something like that, you can say summarize it in the style of a pirate or summarize using only bullet points or something like that. Um, so it, it, it's really neat. It's available on Android. It's available on iOS. It saves your threads as well. So if you go in and start going back and forth because it, it allows you to ask follow-ups and all of that. It's, it's basically a full search engine. Not only that, when you go on the homepage, I forgot this, this is a really neat feature. In the search box itself, in the bottom left-hand corner, it says um, there's a little icon which will by default be all, and that basically searches across the whole of the internet. But if you want to get more specific and you want to focus specifically on maybe academic, uh, so it's looking at uh, published academic papers, or if you want to uh, dig into YouTube or Reddit or Wikipedia, you could even plug into Wolfram Alpha if you need uh, that kind of um, the maths-based computational knowledge engine element. It, they partnered with Wolfram as well. Um, so you can actually change the way that it searches and, and control it um, with quite a bit of detail. It's available for free. If you upgrade, it's a tw you can actually pay $20 a month. If you choose to upgrade, you get access to... I think you get GPT-4 based responses. Uh, so there's a few uh, few add-ons available there that they try to uh, totally, squeeze in. Try yeah, to try to incentivize you uh, to, to start paying as well. But they were featured on the uh, Microsoft Azure blog recently about a company that's like built on top of the Azure and OpenAI stack. Uh, it's a great tool. I've been following the the, the founder on LinkedIn and uh, Twitter since I first came across it. And yeah, can't speak highly enough about it, really. It's, a, it's one of my daily driver AI tools. Interesting. Yeah, I think I'll be having a play with that, especially the ability to search academic papers. I think for those of us working in the life sciences, that's worth playing with. I I think we spoke about this last week, but I recently ran a test um, as part of the Sam's presentation that I was doing that we talked about last week, whereby I used a bunch of different tools to ask what the top five papers on stem cells were, and they all said different things. And some of the tools, like Bard, um, made up citations that weren't real. In fact, they pretty much all made up citations that weren't real in one way or another. Um, so it'd be really interesting to see if this is better, because at this point, you would argue, can you really trust ChatGPT or or Bard or Claude if you are doing research or writing content about the life sciences where you need to be able to bring up and cite accurately real papers? Uh. Which you, you can't trust it. It makes, them, it makes papers up. Um, so I'm going to have a play with this and see if it is any better. Thank you for sharing that with us and the, and the listeners, Martin. Much appreciated. So I think that brings us to the end for today. Thank you very much for your time as always, Martin. It's been a, a pleasure. Just to want to update everyone uh, on some other big news. Uh, the transfer window has opened last week. So Derby County have been making their uh, first signings of the summer. So we've made four signings. Uh, very exciting. We did re-sign Scott Lokes, the keeper, though he's a third choice, I would say. I think he's going to be uh, he's probably going to be more of a coaching role, back up third place on the bench. But uh, they're good to see some some faces coming back into the, the squad. I think you'll agree. Yeah, I think the only thing about this entire episode, I think the thing that will make people angry is why was that not at the beginning? Because that's clearly the most important news of the week. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I uh, honestly, it nearly slipped my mind outrageously, but uh, got it in there in the end. Better late than yeah. never. You did well. I think people will breathe a sigh of relief that they also got a little bit of Derby County news and they can feel better about that. We're going to make Derby County the new Wrexham. Um, <laughs> and if we get them on Disney+, Plus, the uh, the intro credits will obviously be created with Midjourney and other voice synthesis uh, tools that we might use if Matt let us play with their model. But um, 
as always, thank you to you, dear listener. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed. Please do share this with your marketing pals if you think they find it interesting. Subscribe if you haven't already. You can follow us on the Twitters if you go to AI Marketing Pod. That's right. Who That's two weeks in a row. I am all over it. Or go to artificiallyintelligentmarketing.com where you can subscribe to the episodes and you'll get an email in your inbox whenever a new one is out, which of course makes your life much easier. So please do do that as well. Other than that, we'll see you next week. Cheers, Martin. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Artificially Intelligent Marketing. To stay on top of the latest trends, tips, and tools in the world of marketing AI, be sure to subscribe. We look forward to seeing you again next week.